Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ever-present proof of your love for us, your constant grace made evident, Lord, even with the rain, although the rain delays us in our driving and muddies our shoes and gets our floors dirty, Lord, even the rain is a reminder that you are good and faithful, for without the rain, we will die of thirst, our food will not grow. And so, Lord, you, uh, even in these moments of, of times which bring sorrow for a moment or, or difficulties for a moment, even those prove to be evidence of your goodness. And Lord, you do not just pour out your goodness on those whom you love, but you even pour out your goodness on those whom you do not love. You uh, pour out your love on uh, both Jacob and Esau, your grace on both, and yet... Um, It is only those who come to know you who understand the grandness and the beauty of that love. God, as we look at this text tonight, I pray that we would not go the way of Israel. We would not go the way of that rebellious generation and the rebellious generations that followed. But Lord, we would humble ourselves like Moses. We would acknowledge that we are in need of you. Lord, we would would acknowledge that we are in need of Christ. Lord, would we cling to that hope of salvation and nothing else. Amen. It is a joy to be back tonight. Um, the, it was a pleasure to be able to go and serve uh, Grace Baptist Church for a day. Um, again, we have a brother, so a pastor, but a brother who's uh, got surgery tomorrow and everything's difficult. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make it more difficult when you're a pastor, but... It was a joy to be able to go. It's a joy to have men here who are able to preach and to teach on a moment's notice. Um, there was a time in this church when I, if, even if I wanted to go on vacation, it was, um, gonna, okay, Lord, who's going to fill the pulpit? Like, how are we going to do this? But it was a joy to be able to go there and serve them and even provide some pastoral care and counsel for them what to do in the, in the coming days. But tonight, we continue on. We continue through... Stephen, he is giving this sermon, and here he is, he's communicating to the religious leaders who, again, they are absolutely opposed to the gospel, they're opposed to Christ, and again, they they tout their opposition to Christ by pointing to their love of God. They point to their, um, their true love and devotion to God and their opposition to Christ by pointing to how they cling to the Word of God, how they are not idolaters and they are not Um, some misfits and and misled knuckleheads, but they have a pure doctrine by their clinging to the law of Moses. But what Stephen does throughout this, and we've already seen a buildup to it, and what we're going to see tonight and even next week, is that something greater than the temple is here, something greater than Moses is here, and they reject that which is greater. If you truly love the lesser, then you would love the greater. If you truly love the sign, then you would love the thing to which that sign is pointing. You you can't be driving on a long trip, see the sign that says 15 more miles until you're home and say, I love that sign. And you say, why do you love that sign? It says, because it means we're almost home. And then you get home and you say, I hate home. Well, you really don't love that sign. That love for that sign is actually proven a false love when you get home and say, I hate. What happened 15 miles ago? We were on a long journey. You got back. What happened? You know, I really love the sign. Why do you love the sign? Because it points me that I'm almost home, that there's a, there's a, a disruption of reality there. Israel is claiming, these religious leaders are claiming that they have always loved God, they have always loved his salvation. But the banner which I want to fly tonight over this text is that Israel has always resisted God's salvation. It is not a new thing that Israel called, that the Jews called for the death of Christ. That was something that was not, hey, where did this come from? But that is something that is proven throughout the entirety of the Old Testament that Israel, the rebellious generation, the the rebellious chosen people of God, the irony there, you are God's chosen people. And, And what marks you as God's chosen people? Well, we rebel against God often. (laughs) That's peculiar, right? That's peculiar. How can I tell that you're the bride of that man? Because I cheat on him as often as I possibly can. Like, are are you out of your mind? Like, weren't you there for the wedding? Weren't you there for the, 
you know, the proposal and, you know, everything, the glitz and the glamour. We have the, the pictures we can go back to and you know, we can go to the wedding invitations and we have the video and look at the professing of the love of him. Look, he went into all this extravagant length and how do you respond to this extravagant love? You cheat on him. You go and you search after other men like, you know, the, um, what is the, that book title? One who flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, everything here's like, something's misfiring here, right? Something's wrong in the engine. I'm not a mechanic, but I can tell when something's wrong with the engine type of a situation. But Israel has always resisted God's salvation. I'm going to break this, uh, look at kind of three sections, three movements of this part of Stephen's uh, sermon, kind of verses 23 through 29, then 30 through 34, and then 35 through 43. But um, well, let me let me also state this before we really get into it. To understand what Moses is doing here, if you go and you read Genesis, you're gonna miss, or Exodus specifically, you're gonna miss what the Holy Spirit is demonstrating in Acts. Acts gives us a fuller revelation of what's going on. And let, let me set this up. Jesus is greater than Moses. And all of you who've grown up in Sunday school say, well, duh. You're like, well, we know Jesus is greater. You know, Moses was a man, Jesus was God, you know, these type of things. But the reality is Jesus was a greater Moses. Let me, let me set some things. It, 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 says of, of, um, it says of Moses that he grew in, in wisdom and he did words and deeds. Well, consider Luke 2.52, where it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with both God and man. So the wisdom that Jesus had um, was greater than Moses, but the wisdom that Moses had was a foreshadow of someone coming with greater wisdom. Or the words and the deeds that Moses spoke with and that Moses did. Did not Jesus do greater things than Moses? You know, uh, Moses did a lot of amazing things. But if I had to pick between the miracles of Moses and Jesus, I'd pick Jesus. Je Moses did not raise anyone from the dead, did not cure anyone of leprosy, did not cast out any demons. Oh, and did not raise from the dead for my sins or yours. I, I want the words and the deeds of Jesus any day over Moses. But I do want the words of Moses, the deeds of Moses, to see them as signs and pointing to someone is coming greater than Moses. Did not Jesus say, if you don't believe me, my words, then believe my works, believe my deeds. Right? If you don't believe the things coming out of my mouth, then believe what I am doing. And Moses, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe the words? Well, then do these great signs and then they will believe. In 23 through 29, we see that Moses failed Brother, we see here Moses' failed attempt to save Israel. And, and Israel rejected Moses. Every, everything here is pointing that Moses is a, is a shadow. And if you just read Exodus, you're not going to see it until it's revealed in the light of the New Testament. Once the Holy Spirit enlightens us to what's going on, then we can see in the Old Testament. And the, the New Testament as I just recently heard someone say, I've always said this of Hebrews. Hebrews is the greatest commentary in the Old Testament, specifically the Leviticus and the law. But someone said, no, the New Testament is the greatest commentary in the Old Testament. If you're not sure what's going on in the Old Testament, go read the New Testament, and the New Testament will kill you in. But everything in the Old Testament is pointing to what's coming in the New Testament. And so you, you, we read Moses, what goes on in, in Exodus uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. We, we read about the story where there's an Egyptian abusing uh, Israelite. And so Moses goes out at 40 years old, being raised up. And he, and he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to save this guy. And what he does, though, is he kills the Egyptian. And we go, oh, that's, that's bad. You can't kill someone. That's, ooh, we don't, we don't. That's, that's murder. If you just read Exodus, we'd read it that way. And then the next day he goes and he, uh, he goes and he sees that the, the one, uh, presumably the one that was saved, the one Israelite that was saved is now abusing another Israelite. Kind of rings of the parable where the one man was forgiven of a great debt and goes and abuses someone of a small debt, right? Here's a man who is being abused by his 
master by the captors, and then he, this slave goes and abuses another slave. What is wrong with you, right? And we would just read that, and we think, oh, Moses, he was just wrongheaded, just a murderer, and ran away. But what we see here in Acts is actually Moses was acting as a judge and a redeemer, someone who is intervening on behalf of Israel in the name of God. The one Israelite says, who made you a prince and a judge over us? But in Acts chapter 7, verse 35, it's translated into the Greek, who made you a ruler and a judge, a prince or a ruler, not necessarily prince in the sense of a, a kingly line, but prince in the terms of a lord or a prince in the terms of you're a ruler. And who, who made you a prince? Who made you a judge over us? Well, God did. And we normally don't think that God did that until the burning bush, but what Acts is making plain and clear in verse 25, he says, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And we often think Moses ran away for 40 years, but what scripture is saying here is Israel is already hardened, is already hardened. Even though they're crying out for salvation, Israel is already hardened and their slavery goes on for 40 more years. So the rebellious generation that died in the wilderness, if we just run the math, it was actually not just the parents that were rebellious of the children. It was even the grandparents that were rebellious. The grandparents' generation had to die off. So these kids raised up parents who became the grandparents. They died off. The kids rose up, and they became rebellious, just like their grandparents. And those parents, they died in the wilderness. From the beginning, Moses was to be their redeemer, pointing to Christ. And they just don't get it. They don't get it. Who made you a ruler and a judge? Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Again, Israel has always resisted God's salvation. When come, someone comes and, and splits the Red Sea, when someone comes and does great words and say, I'm here in the name of the Lord, we are to worship him, that, that's, that's a good guy to follow. Now, if someone comes and splits the Red Sea and does great signs and says, we are going to go worship Baal or whatever other false god, we go, nope, those are false signs, those are false wonders. And so there's this failed attempt. And so he goes and he runs away. And this really covers Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. But then in verses 30 through 34, it moves on. And now where Moses, you know, he grew up, he was there, tried saving, didn't work. He's 40 years in the wilderness. Now he's going to have that burning bush experience. And that's where most people are familiar with this. We have enough movies, even in popular culture, to deal with this. That great moment where he needs to remove his sandals because he's on holy ground. And why is God doing this? He's because God is now going to commission Moses to go again to save people. Now, the first time there's not a word from the Lord made explicit, made clear. We see it that that is what's going on in Acts, but here it's made clear. You are going to go. And this time you're not just going to go in word and human deeds. You're going to go in, in word and in supernatural deeds, divine deeds, the splitting of the Red Sea, the turning of staves into snakes, turning the water into blood, the frogs, the gnats, the hail, the darkness, and where we get the Passover. But I want you guys to catch and notice that it says in verse 30, it says, an angel appeared to him. But then it goes on and continues and starts saying that the Lord spoke to him. And then again, you go down in verse 38, and it says, was in, um, uh, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with, uh, with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai. In the Old Testament, uh, visions were often given via dreams, uh, or prophecies were often given via dreams or visions uh, of the prophets. But we also see that many times angels were the spokespersons for God. They would come and instead of God speaking to the prophet through a dream, through a vision, he would send an angel. But these angels were not angels like we see. There's been a recent surge of trying to draw pictures of what angels really look like. But the reality is, if you saw an angel, the angel would look more like a man 
than a supernatural scary being. Now, whatever it is would, would cause fear, but often you'll see an angel described as a man, but is not a man, is an angel. We don't want to confuse those two. But prophets and angels, when they spoke on behalf of God, it was as if God himself was speaking. So the Old Testament will consistently say an angel came and God said, or a prophet came and says, thus says the Lord. When an angel or a prophet is speaking on behalf of God, it is God himself speaking. But the unique feature about Moses is that Moses did not receive a word from angels all the time. Here at the burning bush, yes. But at various times, he did not receive a word from God, uh, if you will, just from angels or in visions. But it says in the Old Testament, it says that Moses spoke to God face to face. Now, not metaphysically, not in the tangible sense. God doesn't have a nose. God doesn't have eyeballs. But God spoke directly to Moses, not through an intermediary. In the Old Testament, God spoke to the angels and the prophets, and we see this in Hebrew 1. And the authority with which the angels and the prophets spoke was as if God was himself speaking and not the messenger. But we see, but we see in Exodus 33.11, but Moses spoke directly to, rather God spoke directly to Moses, and it says, as a friend. Right? There is this unique feature about Moses. Moses had a relationship with God that other prophets did not. But you see this setup here, and and this covers really the end of chapter 2 of Exodus and goes into Exodus 3.10. And it says that God sees the affliction of his people and acts to deliver them. And we go, yeah, we like that. God sees the affliction of people and acts to deliver them. Yeah, that sounds like my God. That sounds like a beautiful God. That sounds like a precious God. That sounds like a kind and merciful God. Let me notch it up a bit. Let me ramp it up again. God sees the affliction of his people and acts to deliver them even when he knows they will rebel. God rescued Israel even when he knew they would rebel. God brought them into the promised land even when he knew they would rebel. God made Adam and Eve even though he knew they would rebel. God didn't save you because he knew you would obey. God saved you even though he knew you would rebel. Israel has always resisted God's salvation. This is not something new at the cross. This is not something new with Paul and, and uh, sorry, with Peter and John. This is not something new with the apostles. This is not something new with, with Stephen. But Israel has always resisted God's salvation from the very beginning. But then we go and we see this. Further explanation in verses 35 through 43, where uh, Stephen points out, and he's drawing in that, that this false worship of the heart manifest comes out in physical false worship and continues. We, we at times have, have a high view of Israel, you know, and what was going on, and oh man, it was so awesome, and oh, there was just that one golden calf incident, and there's a couple of things, but man, it was so awesome. But we actually get this picture painted, and it draws from the Old Testament that. Uh, Israel was just wrapped in, saturated in, marinated in their idolatry. At every turn, they sought to resist God. And yet even in this, even in this, God was sustaining them with manna, with water from the rock, with quail. Their sandals did not wear out. Their clothes did not wear out, even while they were carrying false gods with each other. Did you know that bronze serpent, they later turned into another idol to worship falsely? They carried around false gods from Egypt. They didn't just take gold and make a tabernacle. They also took false gods and and they made metal images to worship these false gods, namely Molech or Rathan. Or if you read in Amos, it's called Sekuth and Kiam. And you might go, why is it say it one way in Amos and another way in English? Um, You see this in. The, the difference of language. If you're familiar with Roman mythology and Greek mythology, you'll notice that they have same gods but different names. If you're familiar with Scandinavian and Norse god mythology, 
same gods, different names. And actually, if you look at some Norse and Scandinavian mythology and you mix that with Roman and Greek, you'll notice that there's some overlap. Different language, same false god. Satan doesn't have new tricks. He just has new languages to work with, right? You know, the, um, it's, uh, this isn't adultery. This is just an open relationship. No, same sin, new name. Israel continues to reject God, 35 through 44. It continues to reject. Remember, Israel has always resisted God. In verse 35, we see that uh, they rejected the Moses the first time, but that was only the beginning. This Moses whom they rejected, you see that rejected whom made, and they, how did they say it? They said, who made you a ruler and a judge? But what does the divine inspired word teach us? This man, Moses, God sent as both ruler and not judge, ruler and redeemer. That's salvific language. That's, that's Messiah language. Moses, you're not just to rule and judge. You are to rule and redeem Israel. Moses went back to Egypt and his life was in peril. I was afraid I was going to die. I, I was going to die. I went and I killed a man. I could, be, I could be hung for treason, right? And he went back and he sacrificed his life. He put his life on the line. Again, all this pointing to Christ who actually did die. But Moses was not just a ruler and a judge, but he was a ruler and a redeemer. Moses was rejected the first time, but that was only the beginning. Who made you? That was the spirit of the people whom Moses was going to, to redeem. And in verse 36, we see that 40 years of wonders and signs were not enough. The signs beginning in Exodus 4, take your staff, Moses, and throw it on the ground. And it turned into a snake. The same thing that these, uh, if you will, witch doctors were able to do. They could do it as well. Oh, we, we've got that black magic. Moses says, well, but my, my God sign can eat and consume your black magic. 40 years of wonders and signs were still not enough. So this really fights against the idea, Lord, if you could just show me, if you could just show me, I would believe I would be shored up for life. If you could just, if you could just give me just a visible evidence of this thing that you need me to believe in, if you, if you just show me, I would never ever falter ever again. If 40 years of wonders and miracles in the wilderness won't do it, one glimpse of God's goodness manifested in front of you won't do it. And there's a, even a less supernatural way to demonstrate this. How many of you have ever taken a test, you studied for that test, and yet you still forgot the thing that was most obvious on that test? Like, how did I forget that? One test I had, I had to read a thousand pages of a book. And one of the questions on the test was, what is the name of the author of the book? I didn't know, right? It's like, if you're going to read a thousand pages of someone, you should probably at least find out their name, right? But 40 years of wonders and signs were not enough. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all accounting these signs. But in verse 37, Moses foretells, of a greater prophet, Jesus, which we see in Deuteronomy 18, 15. There is coming a prophet greater than I. Listen to him. 37, what does it say? This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Again, that is pointing to Jesus. They didn't, this rebellious generation already preceded by a rebellious generation, followed by a rebellious generation, three rebellious generations in a row. Israel's always resisted God's salvation. And even when that prophet came, they resisted. And it wasn't even when Christ, the true prophet, came, they resisted. It was every prophet before Christ as well. Christ was not coming on the coattails of a lot of prophets of God who were received and given high honor as a prophet of God. Rather, all these prophets were often ostracized, killed, put out, reviled, rejected. Like we think like, it'd be so cool to be a prophet, right? And that's kind of the cool thing. Oh, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet. 
there's, there's this vibe. Now, really, if you were a prophet of God, you would have a really, really rough life. And the cool ones were told to walk around naked, right? I mean, so like God made sure that prophets weren't cool. God made sure that prophets were a little bit off-putting. So that when Israel had to deal with the word of God, Israel's default response was resist God's salvation. Israel, it says in verse 38, they received the law from Moses on Mount Sinai. And it says the living oracles right there. And you you see this in Exodus 20 through 23, 24 through 31, and 33 through 34, the, the law given on Mount Sinai. I love how it says it there, 38. It says, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, he received living oracles to give to us. Oh, that's beautiful. Living oracles, right? These things, the the living and active word of God. It is not a dead word. Jesus, the divine logos, the divine word, the living word, the God who became flesh, the word which became flesh. Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. Right here again, Jesus being lifted up, being magnified. And then in verses 39 through 41, Israel, they demanded false gods. Israel has always resisted God's salvation, not just in like a subtle way where there's just a resistance. But you know know that resistance that you see in someone or that you produce in yourself where it's not like an overt, direct resistance, it's just low-key. You know, like that small child who were, the whole family's walking, we're all on a walk, and that one child just kind of shuffling their feet and they're like 10, 15 feet behind. Like, Come on, get up, get up, get up, right? You know, just kind of a subtle, like, I'm getting there. My legs are tired, right? So that's kind of like a subtle one, right? Versus the kid who says, I hate you, right? I wish you're all dead, right? They're, they're, that's active. Israel was not just dragging their feet 10, 15 feet behind God. Rather, they said, you know, this guy who just redeemed us from our death in the name of God, you know what we should do? I know the, the mountain's on fire, literally like just the mountain is on fire in a way that no one has ever seen this before. You know what we should do? Because we don't know what happened to this guy. We should make a false God and then call that false God Yahweh and then go back to Egypt. But for the past hundreds of years, we all complained about, this sounds like a great idea. And Aaron's like, sounds good to me. And the best excuse he has is I threw gold in the fire and out popped this idol. Come on, Aaron. Israel demands false God, and this false God was not simply just a a God that was just, you know, there, a golden calf, but it was a God which displayed their idolatry and their sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians makes it clear that the idolatry that they had manifested itself in sexual immorality. How can you tell if there's idolatry in a culture? Do a sexual immorality check. Is our culture an idolatrous culture? Check for rampant sexual morality. If yes, then yes, idolatry. Idolatry, false worship, just like true worship, always manifests itself into real tangible ways. You cannot truly worship God without it blossoming or producing fruit or bearing fruit into real ways. You cannot false worship a false God. You cannot worship a false God without it producing false fruit or bitter fruit. And what is the bitter fruit of idolatry, sexual morality? What is the fruit of, uh, what is the fruit of purity? What is the fruit of true worship? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And if it wasn't enough that they demanded false gods of which they were punished for and many died, tens of thousands died, Israel loved her perverse gods. This quote right here, if you are reading your Bible, it may have the the section beginning in 42, halfway through 42, as it is written. It's kind of offset. Of course, it says it's as it's written in the book of the prophets. Specifically, it comes from Amos chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. If you go and you look there, you'll notice The language is a little bit different, and the reason for that language is the New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and so there's a translation going on.
He says, you, you have, did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices? Were you obeying Leviticus when you were doing that during those 40 years, O house of Israel? Let me remind you, while the tabernacle, while the tent of Yahweh was in your midst, was not the tent of Molech, was not the tabernacle of Molech also there? We always see pictures of Israel around the tent or the tabernacle. But we never see this tent. But biblically, is it not there? Is there not two tents in the midst of Israel? Right? Here they are. They worship God on Sunday, paraphrasing, and they worship Moloch on Monday. And then they go and they worship the sun god on, or the the star god on Tuesday, right? Obviously, they weren't broken up in days the way I'm saying it, but you get it. Whatever they did, to worship God was nullified, was negated, was made invalid by their worship of false gods. Moloch, again, child sacrifice. Burn the child alive. Sexual morality brings about the worship of killing of children. That, that, That is the reality. We live in a culture that, that embraces. And I mean, this is, this is an election cycle, so the conversation comes up hotter and hotter every time. But the reality is, why is abortion a good thing in any culture? Because we love sexual morality. Besides abundant sin, what is the fruit of sexual morality? Children. That's, that, is the, that is the fruit of sexual purity, children. But, the fruit, but that is the desired fruit of sexual purity. But the undesired fruit, the bitter fruit of sexual morality is children. So what do you do with these children? You offer them the molech. You worship your God. You're doing a good thing. The Rephan, or the Kiyum, your star God, Romans 1, you have abandoned worshiping the God of creation to worship the creation. Right? Think of how many projects that need to happen. But no, we can't put a road there. Why? You know, because we need to protect the tree. We need to protect this frog. You know, there's these um, activists who are saying, hey, we're, we're doing bad things. We need to do this stuff. So we need to, we need to sit in the road. Okay, but people can't get to work. Oh, and by the way, what about the ambulances that people are dying, right? But it doesn't matter, right? What, what really matters is this insignificant thing compared to human life. But people have so inverted creation with the creator that now creation is what is to be worshipped. This is not just a pagan thing. This is what Israel was doing. Oh, those nasty pagans. And this was God's people, his chosen ones. And they were the ones clinging to this. You went from Egypt to the wilderness, to the promised land, and to Babylon, clinging dearly to your idolatry. Israel's rejection of Jesus, what Stephen is getting to, Israel's rejection of Jesus did not begin at the cross. Israel's rejection of Jesus began in Egypt. When we think of the response that these people had to Jesus, we're like, what were they thinking? <clears throat> the same thing that their fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers and their fathers were thinking, I don't like or love God. I love my idols. I love idolatry. I love everything that God gives me, yet without God himself. I want the reign of God. I want the son of God, yet without God. I want to be saved from my difficulties, but I don't want the cost of being saved from my difficulties. Often people walk away from Christ 
because they realize that they want to be saved from their sin and then are found out to what they mean is they want to be saved from the consequences of their sin. There's a difference. Do you come to Christ because you realize your sin is vile and disgusting? Or do you come to Christ because you go, you know, I like my sin, I just don't like the the fruit of my sin. For example, parent, how, how have you gotten your children to be obedient? Oh, I spanked them. <gasps> no, I won't have that. Then you won't have obedient children, right? Hey, how, how is it that um, you have a life of peace? What is it? I count myself as a servant to Christ and to everyone. No. I don't want, I don't want peace that comes like, I don't want peace that costs me something. I just, I just want the peace, right? Just give me the peace, but don't, don't have it cost me anything. Hey, how is it that you were just so content with the money that you have? Oh, I, don't, I don't love anything I have. It's all God's. No, 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 no. I, I want to love the things I have. Oh, Christ, we come to Christ. We want to be freed from the consequences. But we, we want to embrace the sin. But we come to Christ, we're going to have to give up our idols. We come to Christ, and he's going to say, you can, you can be with me. I will save you, but you have to give up your idols. And the difficulty, difficult thing is we need to understand that Christ will even allow you to hang out in his church, to hang out among the sheep, and yet not be saved. And I'm not trying to cause you guys to question your salvation, but I'm, I'm getting, I want you to be aware. I want to cause those who are goats <laughs> to be concerned, but I want those who are sheep to be mindful and to be circumspect and say, am I just hanging out with sheep or am I a sheep? Do I go through the motions of worshiping and loving God or do I truly love him? Israel has always resisted God's salvation. But in all reality, Israel is just a picture in this sense of all mankind. Three brief passages for you to consider. Exodus 20 verses 3 through 4 gives two commands. Have no other gods and have no graven images. And we think, Lord, God, I have gone through my house and I I have no other gods. I have no other graven images. Who's your God? I, Jesus is God. Triune God. God the Father, God Son, God the Holy Spirit. One being, three persons. One God. Right? I've got the right answer. No graven images. I don't got any graven images. There, you know, there's not little, you know, Jesus is designed in my house, right? I don't have little things that I bow down to. I've got all the signs. I've got all the molex thrown out, right? God, Asherah, I got them thrown out. Okay, what about 1 Corinthians 10, 14? Speaking, that, that whole chapter is pointing to Israel's example and say this is written as an example for you not to follow but to observe. And it says in 10, 14, flee from idolatry. Because no other gods and no graven images is, is, is idolatry, but we are to not just not have other gods and not to have graven images. It's not enough to not have it, but we must flee idolatry. Paul is writing that to Christians. Paul is writing, flee from idolatry to Christians. He's not writing that to pagans. So let me ask you a question. What loss would cause you, or perhaps what loss has caused you, but what loss would cause you to question God's love, God's goodness, and God's power? If you lost your job, would God not be loving or good or powerful? If your paycheck got cut in half or that check which was supposed to come in to cover a bill, would you question God's love and concern for you? If you lost family members, they began to hate you, despise you, reject you, revile you. If you lost your housing situation, you got a note, so you were evicted. Mortgage company says, pay up or quit. But I've had 30 years. Nope, things changed. 
your house burned, uh, squatters took over, right? Would you question God's love, goodness, and power? Is there a relationship, if you lost that relationship, would cause you to question God? Husbands and wives, this is real important. Parents, this is real important. If you lost your spouse, husband, or wife, parent, if you lost your child, would it cause you to question the love of God? Would it cause you to question his goodness? Would it cause you to question his justice and his mercy and his provision? Because if the answer is yes to any of those, there's an idol you must flee from. But it doesn't have a face. It's not made out of wood. It's not made out of a precious metal. But there is an idol that you have found in your heart. Let, you, let us flee from our idols that we don't put up in our houses, in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, but we put up on the inner man. First, first John, you go and you read that, and if you, took a, if you had to make a four-letter word to simplify John, it would be love, All right? Love. Think of First John, love. You ever read First John? Be like, love. How would you describe First John? Love. Love God. Love others. Love, 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 right? Like if you want to have a great, there's two great Bible passages or uh, chat, uh, books of the Bible to read on uh, Valentine's Day, Song of Solomon and First John, right? Love, right? And at first, the first time you read the last verse of John, it, you get a little bit of theological whiplash. Love, 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 love. Love God, love others, love, love, love. You don't love, you don't love, but if you love, you love. And if you abandon love, if you don't, it's just love, 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 love. And then it gets to the very last verse and it says, oh, and um, keep yourself from idols. We're talking about love. How did you get from love to idols, John? John, clearly you're getting kind of a little bit old and you're kind of, you know, getting out there. How did you get to love? Here's how. What do you love? What do you love? Do you love food? Do you have a hobby you love? Is there a particular pleasure that you love? Or maybe you just love attention in our social media age. Once again, people have always loved it. We just have a we just have a new way to gain that attention. <clears throat> but here's the thing, though. Love is not bad. We just had five chapters saying love is good, and now flee from idolatries. And yet I say, you know, what do you love? Food, hobbies, pleasure, attention. And you're like, oh, yeah, those could really quick become an idolatry. Wait, wait, hold up. So let me put it this way. <clears throat> If your love for food, if your love for hobbies, if your love for pleasure, if your love for attention is not from God and for God, then what you love is your idol. If you love food for you, like food from me and for me, like my love for food is from me and my love of food is for me, idolatry. If, if, if my love for hobbies is from me and for me, idolatry. If my love for pleasure is from me and for me, idolatry. If my love for attention is from me and for me, idolatry. But let's invert it. If, if my love of food is from God and for God, it is not idolatry. Now, you might be saying, no, Pastor John, you're making a bit of a stretch. My love, can my love for food be from God? All good things come from the Father of lights, James chapter 1. Is not food good? If it's not good, let me show you some good food. So if you love food because it is a gift from God, then that love is from God. Well, how can you eat food for God? Well, does not Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether I eat or whether I drink, I eat for the glory of God. 
Lord, I love food because of the good thing you've given me, and now because of this good thing, I'm going to worship you because of this food. Any good thing that God has given us, we can quickly turn into an idol, or we can turn it into a mechanism to bring glory and honor to God. We can turn it into a thing that draws attention to ourselves or draws attention to God. Even consider attention. <clears throat> I want your guys' undistracted attention while I preach. It can be from a place of self-love or love for God. Do I want it because I just love attention? Or do I want your attention so I can take it and shift it to God? Right? So even... Gaining and desiring the attention of someone can be an idol or it can be an act of love. Israel always resisted God's salvation because they sought to turn the attention to themselves, their passions, their pleasures, their appetites, their desires. But the beloved of God says, everything that I have that's been given into my position or possession, anything that's been given to me, anything that I have responsibility, anything that I come into influence over, I want to take that. And according to scripture, I want to craft it so that I can get people's attention, mine and others, back to God. Isn't this good? Please tell me this is good. I, I, I just, I, I love this. People who say, I, I, I just don't like the Old Testament. I go, then you haven't seen Jesus yet. Keep looking. Keep looking. He's there. He's there. He's there. I, I, I pray, brother and sister, that you would not be like Israel and simply not be like Israel in the sense of like, well, I'm not bad like them, but rather I pray that you would be like a lover of God and you would say, anything that I have, I want to turn attention to God. When, his, when he sends, and I'm not trying to be charismatic, but when he sends an angel, I want to hear him as from God. When he sends a prophet, I want to hear him as from God. When he sends a disciple, an apostle, I want to hear him as from God. When the preached word is proclaimed, I want to hear from God. And then I want to see God. I want to love God. I want to cast my desires and aspirations to God. There's, oh, oh I'm, I'm tongue-tied, and I will ramble if I don't close it. So, brothers and sisters, please, please flee from idolatry and love God. Amen. Well, let's pray, and then we'll sing. Thank you for enduring with me today. Um, I, I, I love you guys. I, I love going and preaching elsewhere. There's a time I would have loved to just spend hours and hours and hours days and weeks going and just preaching all over. But the more I've been here, the more that I get to know the sheep that I'm responsible to care for, the more I love being here. And so I love going and helping GBC. But like, and for the glory of God, right? The glory of God, I just said, for the glory of God. But I love being here more. Um, you guys are precious. You guys, are uh, your appetite for the word, your desire for the word, your desire to know, which is it's precious stuff, guys. Cling to Christ. Please cling to Christ. Should I die? Should I perish? Cling to Christ. Oh, Lord, would you draw us near to you? God, would you rid us of the idol factory that our heart is? God, would you draw us near to you in a purity of love? God, not as a simplistic love that the world twist and contorts and waters down, but in the, the pure, raw, rich, oh, full and, and dynamic love that is revealed in the triune Godhead and poured out on us through Christ, through the work of the cross. Lord, would we ever drink deep of the well of the love of God so that we might have the energy needed to run from idols. We love you, God. Thank you for being good to us, even though we have resisted you all. Amen.